Hi, everybody. This is Janet Dayfo again, doing a video with Ron Davis. And this time it's not a research update. It's just an alert to everyone that the annual uh, symposium on the molecular basis of MECFS is happening next week. And it's organized by Ron. And as you know, it was in person for many years and now it's on Zoom for I think the third year. And I wanted to just interview Ron a little bit about what's happening next week so you can be aware of it. So tell us about the meeting, Ron. Well, we've invited uh, about 180 people. I think most of them are going to be on at least part of the time. Uh, making it Zoom is actually pretty convenient for people. Um, so what's it, the meeting about? Well, it'll, it will be focusing on the molecular basis. Uh, we really need to figure out the molecular basis of MECFS. Uh, there'll be very little discussion about uh, treatments or symptoms. Uh, that's not a bad thing, but that belongs in a different meeting. Uh, if we can figure out the molecular basis of it, we have stand a, a really good chance of curing it. And that's the reason to constantly focus on the molecular mechanism. Uh, that really requires a lot of training in biochemistry and uh, physiology and genetics and so forth, but there's a lot of good people out there that are now studying MECFS at the molecular level. Uh, people will come from all over the world to, to this meeting. I think it'll be great. So you do focus on research that's likely to provide answers to the patients, right? It's not just an esoteric thing about what's interesting about the disease. No, it's not focused about what's interesting. It's really trying to drive what is actually causing this disease? And people have a lot of ideas, but now you have to test them. And uh, these will be things that are done that, that test these ideas. Some are very hard to test. Uh, and it, being in human, you can't do very much in the way of, of probing and experimentation. Uh, but still, I, I think this is the right thing for us to be doing to, because I want to try to figure out a cure for this disease. Not me necessarily personally, but try to get the community to be able to do that. Um, there's, there's a little too much focus on just measuring things and not trying to integrate what it means and how we can use it. And I want to get away from that. So um, I know that you're working on things in your lab, like the attacking shunt and the metabolic trap, which are hypotheses about the cause. What do you um, think about people outside of your lab? Are, are there people outside of the lab that are working on things that you find um, useful for figuring out the molecular basis of the disease? Well, there are some people who have some ideas that it's, you know, it's caused by uh, autoantibodies, um, that's possible. Uh, they need to try to evaluate that and see if that's the case. Um, so you have a lot of people coming to the meeting. A lot of them are working on multiple aspects, correct? Yes. And, and uh, although we're not uh, exclusively by, uh, bringing those people in, we're bringing in other people that have done a good job uh, of doing research in MHFS. Even some doctors are coming. Um, but uh, we're trying to convince them to keep focusing on the molecular basis of it, because I think that's the best way for us to get to a cure. I really think this thing is curable because there are some spontaneous remissions and those people are totally normal as far as I can tell. And so it's not doing a lot of damage to the body, even though you might feel like your body is completely shot from all this disease, but I don't think it is. You mean not permanently? Not, not in a permanent way, that's right. So do you feel excited about where we're at now with all the science that's going on around the world? I think we're in a much better place than we have been in the past. Uh, the really difficult part of this is the lack of funding. And a lot of people know that it's really difficult to get a grant if you work on MHFS. So how, how much optimism do you have about what the state we're in now compared to a year ago? I'm getting pretty optimistic that we're going to come, we're going to figure out uh, the underlying cause. Uh, there's a lot of good ideas. 
uh, there's a lot of ideas coming back and re-exploring things that were talked about in the past. Uh, and some of those actually may be quite relevant. And also tr trying to bring in other, other data uh, into this field that from like heart disease and so forth that actually might be relevant. Uh, <clears throat> there's long COVID. Uh, long COVID uh, work is often totally dismissing of MHFS, so it's not necessarily very relevant, and I don't have any of those talks. A, a few of them will be there or mentioned. Uh, but we have invited uh, long COVID people to come to this meeting so that they can be more connected to what the MS, MECFS people are doing, correct? Yes, yes that's correct, because there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I really would like to see any of these big grants on long COVID required to have a person that is an expert in MECFS to make sure that they don't forget that. And uh, a lot of the publications on long COVID are totally neglect uh, the past history of MECFS. And that's a, that's, a, that's a travesty because it's just a lot of wasted effort. So I know that the patients would love to see videos of all the talks. <laughs> The meeting is going to go from Tuesday to Friday from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. to try to um, make it possible for people in different parts of the world time zones to be able to participate. Um, but uh, we're not recording it. You want to talk a little bit about why, Ron? What I want people to do is to talk about their unpublished data as much as possible. They first have to get background of where they, they got to this, but it'll. Uh, we want them to be able to talk about unpublished things and feel safe about it. Uh, because if it turns out to be a, a public meeting and people don't realize that and go talk about it to somebody else and it gets put out in Twitter and whatever, it, it becomes uh, actually divulged. And that can actually cripple people's being able to get it published. It also would uh, cause nobody to get a patent on it. And patents can be extremely important for, uh, for disease research, um, because if you have to go to industry to get something produced, uh, they need protection uh, for all the effort they put into it, and they simply won't do it if there's no patent. So uh, we have to protect the patent, we have to protect the, the, the researchers, and uh, they have to feel comfortable about it. And, uh, it, and it doesn't matter so much if it turns out, well, that's not correct. Uh, we, that's what we do on a daily basis, do experiments and then try to determine whether that's actually correct or not, and maybe do some more experimentation. So it's, it's really important to rule out things that are wrong so other people don't go down that path too, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely right. But it can help other researchers to uh, to know some of these things, uh, and they might they might say, "Oh, I was going to go do those experiments, but gee, he just talked to me about that, or she." Or they might decide to collaborate and do it together. If you see some aspect of it that is not done, you can talk to them about it. Many uh, collaborations have come out of your meetings, isn't that true? Yes, that's correct. And that's been really exciting. But right. we have to be careful not to say that everybody's collaborating because. Uh, then they won't be able to be uh, grant, uh, reviewers grant reviewers at NIH. That's why this is not called a collaborative group. It's called a working group. Right, because we definitely need uh, good uh, reviewers we need at NIH. Reviewers. We, do not, we don't want to exclude all of them. <laughs> They're being real trouble. It's, it's bad enough so as it is. It's not just that that's unpublished. It's also that you want them to be able to hypothesize and just brainstorm and feel free to say stuff that might sound nuts to them, but get feedback on it, right? And they wouldn't want that to be public. Correct, and you, and you can say stupid things in this meeting because nobody's gonna hold you accountable for it. Well, nobody even thinks they're stupid. <laughs> no, they don't, but people who, who might talk about it might think, gee, this is team naive. I, should, I, should I mention this? Absolutely, you're safe. A lot of times those are ideas that are the ones that are very <laughs> fruitful, right? Right, because somebody else can come in and say, yeah, you're right, this could be in here, and they'll add something to it to make it more likely. And uh, that kind of open discussion and brainstorming is what you want the scientists to be able to do. But it's certainly true that new ideas are what we need. And mm -hmm. there's a, yeah, a lot totally. of people are sort of think if it's a new idea it's not possible or something they're sort of stuck in the present right and we need those new ideas yes. um to to like 
Correct. turn around the whole field, right? That's right. what we need. Right. And that's why he wants this to be a safe space for those things to occur. So there are a few people who said they might um, want their talk to be recorded. So we're gonna ask people if they want it recorded. Um, uh, and if that happens, you might get to see uh, some of them. Uh, there's no guarantees about any of that, but uh, then we would turn off the recording after that person was done. Um, and that recording will be given to the individual who asked for it, their own recording of their own talk. And it's up to them what they want to do with it. Um, we, we, we will not keep a copy of it because I, I think people need to feel safe that there is no recording of this. Uh, because it could be that the investigator who has it copied decides, oh, gee, you know, there's some information in here I really have to keep. Uh, quiet and um, I'm going to destroy my own copy. So uh, they get to control it. So I'm going to try to tweet about who's talking, maybe if they let me and just kind of let you guys know what's going on. Um, but there won't be any uh, real scientific content in my tweets, just right. That's so good. that you can right. know that it's happening and and sort of be aware that there's an interaction between all these great people. This is the biggest it's ever been. And being on Zoom has enabled him to have it get bigger because uh, before, you know, uh, Open Medicine Foundation was funding the whole meeting, including all the food and the hotels and airplanes for everybody. And, um, we, you know, we really want that money to go for the research. So, um, and this has enabled um, Ron to include more people. Yeah, and the uh, finding a room is difficult. That's big for, like this, so uh, we have to rent a room, and we don't have to do that anymore. Um, so, are is this Ron being excited today, or yeah, yeah, just I'm, like I'm excited and a little exhausted? <laughs> yeah, planning takes a lot of energy, and, and there's always problems, and you can't get somebody and. Yeah, you email them over and over, they don't answer, you call them up and they don't respond. And uh, you almost feel like I got to get in there and go to their home and pound on their door. <laughs> <laughs> but then when they come, they're all into That's it. That's right. It's just because everybody's, everybody's the, good, the good side is they're really, really busy. And so it's a, I'm very hard to get a hold of. So we, yeah, you have to go through me to yeah, get exactly, to him. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, we want you to know that during all of this, we're thinking about you, the patients, all the time. And we're very devastated by the amount of suffering that's happening, uh, that you're experiencing. And we're just hoping and praying and doing everything we can to um, find answers soon. And I don't think Ron has ever been more optimistic than he is right now about that that might be somewhat soon although as you know science isn't predictable yeah uh, it's, that's unfortunate you're not you don't know you're there until you're there but it does seem closer than it ever did right it, it does because we understand a lot more about it uh the disease now and we have a lot of really pretty good ideas about what might be a, at least a component uh, of what's going on uh, the value of long COVID is you have a chance to see the molecular basis of what happens at the very, very beginning. And that's, that's missing in MHFS. And that's because doctors don't know anything about it. You have to see like 20 doctors before you get a diagnosis and it's five years later. So, so almost all the studies on MHFS are people who've had the disease for a long time. And that might look a little different and it might mislead us. Uh, and we really need some data on the uh, on the beginning. So I'm going to do a little photo bomb here. <laughs> Ashley's out of town, and here's her little doggy Frankie. She says <laughs> hi to everybody. Okay, we're really looking forward yeah. to next week, and we really appreciate all the support and interactive tweets and Facebook posts and messages that we get and I relay them to Ron and I send him the articles that you guys send me and we feel very connected to all of you. Yeah. And, you know, we send you our love. So hang in there, please. Yeah, please. I know it's hard. <sighs> yeah, okay. Bye. Bye.